I'm Dr. Ken Landa. Let's talk about cancer of the colon and let's talk about what the appropriate methods of screening happen to be. Now you hear a lot of talk about a test on the television these days called the Cologuard. Fancy commercial. And the question is really, is it any good? Is it as good as some of the standard tests? Well, cancer of the colon and rectum, obviously a very important disease. 135,000 people going to be diagnosed with that disease this year and 49,000 people going to die. That means about 8% of all cancers are cancer of the colon rectum, 8% of cancer deaths are cancer colon rectum. It seems that the likelihood of being diagnosed with having cancer, cancer of the colon rectum, sometime in your life is about 1 in 20, 1 in 25. It's thought that it's more common in men than in women, more common in African Americans than in Caucasians. It seems if you have a family history, you have a greater chance of developing the disease. And the average age at diagnosis is about 68. Now, if you have the diagnosis of cancer of the colon rectum, the likelihood of your surviving five years is 65%. That's not too bad. If the cancer is diagnosed when it's localized to the bowel wall, then you have a 90% five-year survival. If it's already spread to the lymph nodes, then the survival falls to about 70%. And if it's metastatic, at the time of diagnosis, then the likelihood of five-year survival falls to only about 10 to 15 percent. What's the likelihood the cancer is going to be diagnosed when it's still localized, localized to the bowel wall? Well, it's only about 40 percent. 35 percent more have spread to the lymph nodes, and about 20 percent at the time of diagnosis already have cancer that's metastatic. Now, it's thought that most of the cancers start as polyps. So the question is, how common are polyps? 30 to 50% of adults are going to have some kind of polyp, and two-thirds of those polyps are going to be called adenomatous polyps. And it's the adenomatous polyps, not all polyps, just the adenomatous polyps that can degenerate into cancer. But not all polyps, not all adenomatous polyps, have to get to be the cancer. But the larger they are, so if they're more than a centimeter, more than three-eighths of an inch long, then you have a higher chance of developing cancer from them. Now, it's important to realize that even without screening, the likelihood of dying from cancer of the colon over the past 50 years in the United States has fallen by about 50%. That's even with one-third of the people not being screened. And everybody has the idea that colonoscopy is so good, but colonoscopy is better to detect cancers that are in the left side of the colon compared to the right side of the colon and there's a significant variation in the expertise of different gastroenterologists in looking in the colon through a colonoscopy. So there are a lot of variations that you have to consider. Now, According to the United States Preventive Services Task Force, that's the group that decides frequency of all sorts of tests and the worth of different kind of tests for the heart, the lung, the kidneys. Well, when they look at the benefits of screening for the colon and the rectum, they say that, well, we have significant benefit for people between the ages of 50 and 75. Over age 75, persons should be screened on the basis of individual decisions, whether you've been screened before, what your general health is, do you have any kind of symptoms, what's family history. All of those factors are important. Well, what are the screening tests we have available? You can take the stool and do some kind of an examination for blood. You usually collect some of the stool, send it off in the mail, and it's sent to a laboratory, and they just analyze the amount of blood that happens to be in the stool. Now, some of the tests are highly sophisticated. Some of the tests are very sensitive. Some of the tests require all sorts of change in the diet. You can't take aspirin. You can't do this. You can't have meat. And other tests doesn't make any difference what you do. Obviously, the price depends on which particular tests you choose to undergo. Now, we also know that flexible sigmoidoscopy, unfortunately in decline in the United States, not done very much. But if you have a flexible sigmoidoscopic examination where they stick a tube in, it's not like the colonoscopy. It's not as long as the colonoscope. It only looks at about a third of the colon. But if you do that every 10 years and you combine it with one of those fecal blood tests, well, that's as good as any other kind of testing. And colonoscopy, interestingly, we don't have any definitive evidence, only indirect evidence that it's beneficial. We don't know how it compares with just a simple flexible sigmoidoscopy that can be done every 10 years in the office and then a simple fecal blood test. Well, 
if you undergo the colonoscopy, there are some potential risks. Number one is it's very expensive. Number two is it takes a whole day out of your life. But then when you do the prep, it can cause dehydration. Dehydration causes electrolyte problems. Electrolyte problems can increase the incidence of heart-related events. And then we know there's infections and perforations and bleeding. And there are problems with sedation. All of those have to be considered. Well, what are the recommended tests? So again, this United States Preventive Services Task Force looked at all of the tests available and they said the recommended tests are all equivalent. That's right, the tests are all equivalent that I'm going to tell you about. One is the fecal occult blood test or the fecal immunochemical test. That's where some stool is analyzed in the laboratory for blood. And those tests, if done yearly, if you do it every year, that's as good as the flexible sigmoidoscopy every 10 years combined with the blood test, the test to see how much blood is in your stool. And that is equivalent to every 10 years undergoing a colonoscopy. So all of those tests are equivalent, or basically equivalent, according to this monitoring agency. Now, they say there's some alternate tests. Alternate tests, for instance, you could have the virtual colonoscopy, or you could have this Cologuard test that you see advertised. We'll tell you about that in a moment. The evidence supporting these two tests, these alternate tests, isn't all that great. We don't have any long-term data. We don't really know what they do for the likelihood of morbidity or mortality from cancer of the colon. We don't know all that much about the long-term results. We know if we're talking about this Cologuard test, it's sensitive. So if you have something wrong, it's probably going to detect it. But unfortunately, it's not very sensitive. So even though you might be normal, it might say that you're not normal. And that's obviously a problem. And we don't know how often you should have the test. Well, if we talk about the Cologuard test, it was developed at the Mayo Clinic by a gastroenterologist and he, working with Exact Science, a company in Wisconsin, developed an automated method for finding some DNA abnormalities, some methylation of certain kind of genes and some mutations of other kind of genes. And they also do a blood test of the uh, stool. And if you combine through a special kind of an algorithm the changes in the DNA, the changes in the blood, then theoretically you're going to get a good result. Now, it's very sensitive, so that's very good. And if you have something wrong, it's probably going to detect it. The problem is that in 10 or 15% of the cases where there's absolutely nothing wrong, it's going to say there's something wrong. And then you're going to have to go and get the colonoscopy that you didn't want to do in the first place. And unfortunately, we find a significant number of the people who are told to go get the colonoscopy because you have an abnormal test, abnormal cologuard, they're not going through, they're not following through. So about 6% of the specimens sent to the laboratory, you collect it at home, it's a relatively simple, straightforward test. You send it out in the mail within a day of getting the specimen. They analyze it very quickly, but unfortunately about 6% of the tests can't be utilized there's either something that you did wrong or some kind of problem in the laboratory. And we know that, as I said, there are somewhere between 10, 15% of false positives, so you're otherwise okay, but the test shows that you have some kind of problem. It was approved in 2014, came out with full page ad in the New York Times, heralding this as the greatest thing under the sun for testing for colorectal cancer. But unfortunately, they've had some disappointing sales, especially when the United States Preventive Services said that their test was an alternate test that wasn't one of the preferred tests. And as a matter of fact, they had a previous assay, same company, previous assay, and it only detected about half of the cancers and less than one in five of the adenomas. So they changed the buffer and they changed the way they look at the hemoglobin, they added the hemoglobin test, and they changed some of the markers, and now it's a better test, obviously. They recently funded a nine-week pilot TV campaign in five different markets and it shows the power of advertising. They were able to increase the number of doctors who ordered the test by about 50 percent. Isn't all that heavily used. In January, February, March 2015, the number of tests done was 11,000 for the whole three months in the country. In 2016, same period, 
January, February, March, they did about 40,000 tests. Well, question is, is it a good screening test? Well, it's, you don't have to go and, and, and do any special preparation for the test, so that's kind of a good idea. But it's only for people who happen to be at normal risk. It's not a replacement for people who are at high risk, if you have a lot of family history, if you happen to have a history of cancer. It's not good for cancer surveillance. It's only available by prescription. And remember, if the test is positive, you have to undergo a colonoscopy. And if you happen to be older, over age 75, the test is much less accurate than it is for younger individuals. And it's sensitive to a lot of things. So if you happen to have diarrhea, if you have blood in your urine, if you're menstruating, if you have even a cut on your hand, you can't have the test done. And the test is expensive. The test costs $650. Medicare is going to reimburse you about $500. How often should you have it done? Well, probably about every three years, but that's without any good evidence. That's just what the company says, and that's what Medicare says, and that's what the FDA says. But is there any evidence to support that? The answer is no. So what should you do? I'll tell you what. There's nothing less expensive. There is nothing better. There is nothing simpler than the old-fashioned examination of the stool for blood. You can do this at home, send it off to the laboratory. Simple, cheap, and accurate. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.